Welcome to the Catholic Community Scripture Study, brought to you by St. John the Evangelist in Jackson, Michigan. I will be your host, Todd Gale, as we walk our way through the epic biblical stories of 1st and 2nd Samuel. Welcome aboard. We're in chapter 21, David and the Holy Bread. I'm going to just do a really brief opening prayer today because I want to, sh I want to hit the Psalms as they come up in the story. We're going to do three Psalms today. I think we'll get that far. Three Psalms as they come up in the story. And one of them I really like because without the Psalm, the scene doesn't make a lot of sense. Like, I don't really know what's going on until you read the Psalm. And the psalm explains some things, which is really cool as we get to that today. So we're in the famous scene with David and the Holy Bread, chapter 21. We'll start with a brief prayer and then dig right in today. Are you ready? Okay, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord Jesus, we love you, we praise you, and we honor you. We thank you so much for you giving us your word. Thank you that the word can penetrate not only into our minds, but into our hearts. And Lord, let it penetrate into our actions. Let us learn from the faults of Saul. Let us learn for, from the good moves that King David makes. He makes some bad moves too, but let us learn from his good moves. And let us learn mostly from um, what it is that you want to reveal to us in each of these uh, scenes that we'll be reading today. So we ask for you to just let this penetrate our hearts, let it shape our lives, let it impact us and sculpt us to be the people that you want us to be. And the people said, Amen. Amen. All right, David and the Holy Bread, chapter 21. Let's read verse... Oh, we'll just do 1 through 9. We'll do that whole section. At the end of the scene, when David killed Goliath, Back in chapter 17, verse, so chapter 17, verse 54, David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his armor in his tent. Do you remember when we talked about that before? Like, that was a little weird. Like, Jerusalem wasn't really a, a, a Jewish city at that point. It wasn't an Israelite city. Um, the tent, meaning, like, what exactly is that? Is that his personal tent, or is that the tent of the tabernacle? But the tabernacle's missing, right? As far as we know, the tabernacle was destroyed in Shiloh. Like, so it, it leaves us like, there's a, it's a little odd. Why does he go to Jerusalem? Why did, why did he do that? Why does he leave that there? Well, then we hear, here in chapter 21, the sword of Goliath is with the priest in Nob. What, what is this? Well, a little digging, and we find out Nob is literally about a hundred yards off the front doorstep of Jerusalem. It's, it's so close to Jerusalem, it could be considered a suburb. And Nob seems to be the city where the priests fled after Shiloh was destroyed. And a few of the priests seem to have fled to this little city of Nob. And they set up some kind of sanctuary space. Because it doesn't look like it's the tabernacle, but if we read our text note, um, the text note, so back on uh, 21.1, where it says Nob, it's on page 44. Nob, northeast of Jerusalem, in the eastern slope of Mount Scopus, Nob is called the city of priests in the next chapter. Because, Shiloh, because the Shiloh clergy found refuge there after the Philistines captured the ark, way back in chapter 4 and demolish the, the Shiloh sanctuary, which we find out in Jeremiah. Because remember 1 Samuel, that never says what happens to the, to the sanctuary. It never says what happens to the tabernacle. We had to kind of piece that together. And here it says, the Mosaic tabernacle is currently stationed in Nob. Every other commentary I looked at said, no, it's not the Mosaic tabernacle, because there's nothing left anymore of it. So I, I found that a little interesting that they were... They were pretty solidly sure <laughs> that the Mosaic Tabernacle is currently stationed there. It looks like there's not much of the tabernacle left, but there's somehow they're piecing together some kind of worship space. It looks like the priests have 
a place where they're offering sacrifices. They definitely have a place where they're keeping the bread of the presence. We're going to talk about here in a minute. So it seems like the city of Nob might have been when it said David took the, the sword of Goliath to Jerusalem. It may have actually been here, right outside of Jerusalem. Does that make sense? And we're going we're gonna to watch how this plays a little bit more. We'll go back into some detail here in a minute. So David comes to Nob, to Ahimelech, who is the priest. His name, by the way, means, my brother is king. Remember Melchizedek? The name Melech is king. So Ahimelech, or Ahimelech, <laughs> means my brother is king. It's going to talk about his brother is Ahijah, which is um, the king, which is my brother is God. My brother is Yahweh. Yahweh. Ahijah, right? So, so those two names kind of, just for what that's worth, I always like those Jewish meanings in that. So David goes to the priest Ahimelech. Ahimelech meets David, and he's trembling. Why is he trembling? Like a fierce warrior. Yeah, David's a fierce warrior. And like, he knows he's tied to the king, and why are you here in this little town? What's going on? Like, what, what's happening? And why are you alone? And why is no one with you? And David probably looks a little bit disheveled. Probably looks a little, a little upset. Because what's he doing? In the scene just before this, this is when Jonathan and David find out for sure, no shadow of a doubt, Saul is out to kill David. Right? Up until then, they're a little like, eh, a little squishy. Jonathan's like, no, Dad's not going to get you. Dad doesn't have anything against you. That's, no, it's not going to happen that way. And then at their dinner table, their dinner party, Jonathan arises from the table in a fierce anger, right? When he realizes, oh my gosh, Dad is trying to kill David. So, what's that? And him now, too. He's going after his own son. He throws a spear at Jonathan. So, David is probably not looking like it is a regal royal best <laughs> as he appears. So the priest is a little shaken. He's trembling. Why are you alone? David kind of is a little deceptive here. It appears. It appears. Is he telling the truth? Does he have men with him yet? It doesn't seem like he does. It doesn't sound like he's gathered people. We're going to talk about that here in a little bit. He says, the king has charged me and said, don't tell anyone what I'm about to do. I'm going to send you on a secret mission. And oh, oh, by the way, I have a whole bunch of other men out in the woods, and we're all really hungry. And, uh, and you know, I, I've been sent by the king. It's a secret mission. And all my army buddies, we all need food. And so the priest says, I don't have any regular bread. All I have is the lachem hapamim. The lachem hapanim. The bread of the presence. What is that? Do you remember, especially when we did Galatians, we talked about this a bunch. What was the bread of the presence? Okay, in the tabernacle, it was originally supposed to be in the tabernacle on a golden table, the same place where the menorah is um, and the, the altar of incense, if I remember right. And there's a table of, this gold table of the bread of the presence. And the bread of the presence in, in Hebrew, it literally means the bread of the face of the Lord. Remember that? So they had a bread, 12 loaves of bread, that they changed out every week. And they would bake it fresh. And on the Sabbath day, they would set it out. And this bread, they believed, was representative of the face of the Lord. Like, do you get that? Is that not amazing? In the Jewish uh, ritual, in the Jewish way of worship, they believed there was bread that had a special presence of the Lord. And it was treated very solemnly. Who could eat that bread? Only the priests. At the end of the, ro yep, at the, end of the rotation, they would, uh, the, weeks, the bread is now seven days old. They put out fresh bread. Um, if you saw an episode of, of The Chosen, it starts off with this scene, and it's really cool. They do a flashback to this, because then it, it flashes forward to what we're going to talk about in a minute, too, with Jesus. 
And it was really cool because it kind of demonstrated, we think of loaves of bread like, you know, a loaf of Wonder Bread or something like that. It's the flat bread. It's like the matzah. So it's these big, flat loaves of bread. And as they lay them out, they name each of the 12 tribes of Israel. Each one. It's just really a beautiful scene. Didn't that really represent the manna from the desert? Yeah. So in one sense, it's the manna from the desert. So And, and it's the representation that God is with them through all that. So that the face of God is with them. But at the same time, it's that this bread, which is called, I mean, it's, it's the lechem, which is bread. Lechem is bread. Hapanim, bread of the presence. It's like the bread of the presence of the Lord. So this is really holy bread. Now, obviously, we've got lots of Eucharistic ties with it. But what's really interesting, the priest says, okay, well, you're starving. You are the king's representative. You're on a good mission. As long as you've kept yourself pure and, and ritually pure the way a priest would, then I guess you can eat it. So the controversy begins. <laughs> there are two schools of thought. And the two schools of thought argue this for over a thousand years after this incident. There's even a rabbi named Jesus <laughs> who talks about this a thousand years later. And this is, is one of the most commented on scenes that rabbis like like did commentary like they would do their you know their homilies so to speak when they're, when they're doing their um, time in the synagogue and the teaching that the the um, rabbis loved to talk about this scene and there are two schools of thought what do you think they would be thinking about this scene and about what happened is it a good thing or a bad thing did he do the right thing or not the right thing depends on what school of thought. So the school of thought, right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So think of it, yeah, sort of like conservative liberal, ultra traditional versus a little more modern. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so what's the ultra conservative, the ultra traditional, I'll say, point of view? You can't do that. What are you doing? It's not. It's consecrated. It's not for the lady. It's only for the priest. So it must be that Ahimelech is lax. He's not following the law, the rules. He doesn't know the law. Besides, we've seen what's already happened with Israel at the, up to this point in, in 1 Samuel. Like the priests don't know what the heck they're doing. He just doesn't know what he's doing. Like he's just doing everything wrong like everybody else. So there's that school of thought that says, oh, that was horrible. We should learn from that. It's really bad. But there's another school of thought. The other school says what? David was, he claimed that he was a king's representative, and the king is anointed one, supposedly, therefore, yeah. why can't... Why can't I have it? Right. And, and, and what's it for? And what's it ultimately for? Starving. Feeding starving people that are on the king's mission. Mm -hmm. so, so in Judaism, there's this thing about when two laws collide, mm -hmm. when two rules collide, what rule is going to take precedent? For example, there's a rule... On the Sabbath, you should do no work. Well, what? Right. So that's what Jesus says. If an ox falls in the hole and and he's gonna die, and this is your source of farming and meat and everything else, what you're gonna pull that darn that darn ox out of the hole? You're not gonna sit there with your clock and wait until 1201, <laughs> you know, or or sunrise, I guess is what they would do the next day, and then pull it like you would save it, right? Why? Because when those two rules collide, mercy triumphs over, in this case, over sacrifice. Mercy is going to triumph over sacrifice. That's, what, that's the way Jesus says it. When Jesus tells a story, he's on that side. He's on the more, what we might say, the more liberal side of things. I don't like to use that term, but the more uh, merciful side of things. Right? He's going to say... Mercy triumphs over sacrifice. Because there's also this rule on the Sabbath day, you're not supposed to work. What if you're a Levite? Somebody has to get the sacrifices ready. Somebody has to serve as like the, the altar server. Somebody has to be like the sacristan and get, get all the tools ready and light the candles. And then there's music. There's musicians. Well, they're singing. It's the Sabbath. Oh, not to mention the priest. The priest is doing heavy, hard work slaughtering animals on the Sabbath. 
is that rest? You know, so it's like, well, obviously there, those two laws collide, and obviously the work of the priest at that time that supersedes the law of rest, right? Well, Joyce? Is that exemption written in the law? Yeah, well, but it's not. No, actually, it's not specifically written, which is part of why the two laws co collide. Right? It's not specifically written. Yeah, it is specifically written. These are the things the priest is supposed to do. So, what do you do? The law, did, God didn't tell Moses, well, accept. Everyone rests, accept. <laughs> and, and what do you do if you're, you know, a mother and you've got little toddlers? You don't just sit there and say, we well, have to wait, darling. <laughs> you have to wait till sunrise. And then, you've got to do some things. I know, I know. <laughs> I have so many things we can go off on. That. So, so the Jews have always known there's a, there's a time when laws collide, when they just don't, you can't do one over the other. And when, you, when they do collide, what are you going to do? You're going to do the merciful thing first. At least that's the way Jesus says. Jesus says, always do the thing that's going to save someone. Do the thing that's going to be the most loving, right? So when Jesus tells a story, Rabbi, a thousand years later, he sides with the school that says, of course you're going to, of course feed the people that are starving, right? Um, so the priest gives him this holy bread. I think I said everything there. The incident with the priest, it's unlawful for the laity. Um, it made a huge impact through the years. Now, when this is happening, though, a certain man, verse 7, one of Saul's servant, Saul's servants, is watching. That that setup makes you think like, oh, you know, you know warning. Take take note of this guy. I, me thinks he's going to show up again, <laughs> right? I have a feeling he's being introduced for a reason. He's Doeg the Edomite. Who are the people from Edom? Edom. Do you remember Edomites? What's that? Saul was not an Edomite. Edomite is outside of Israel. Yeah. So back in Jacob and Esau, so Jacob's family becomes Israel. Esau's family becomes the Edomites. Edom means red. It means red. He was red and ruddy and red and hairy. You remember that? There's another Edomite that shows up about a thousand years later. Herod. King Herod is not a Jew. He's an Edomite. So Herod comes from this line with this guy, this Doeg, this, this spy that's spying on behalf of Saul. Interesting that Saul has an Edomite as a sidekick. He's not Jewish, right? He's not Israelite. Kind of interesting. Keep your eye on Doeg. He's going to come up again. Um, and then David says, David doesn't just want to eat the bread. What else does he want? A weapon. Oh, and it just so happens, do you think he knows? Well, of course he knows. He's the one that took it there. <laughs> He's the one that took it there. He knows where it is. And he says, uh, oh, by the way, is there a weapon I could use here? And the, and, and the priest says, the sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom you killed, behold, it is here. This is very interesting wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. That Hebrew word cloth is not the usual word for cloth. It's wrapped in an everyday tunic of a commoner. It's not just a cloth. It's an everyday layperson's, like a work person's, layperson's shirt that it's wrapped up in, but it's behind the priest's ephod. Like it's kind of hidden. So think for a second of just the visual of this. The priest's big garment is hanging, probably had a hanger, empty. There's nobody wearing it. Where's the sword? It's not with the priesthood. It's with the common man. It's with the layperson. It's literally wrapped in a layperson's shirt. I don't know. I just think that kind of says a whole lot of cool stuff there. I thought that was really interesting. Like how Jesus maybe humbles himself and becomes like one of us, right? 
But I just find it interesting, like visually, if, you, if it's like a movie scene, it, it passes by the empty ephod, this empty, you know, royal priestly garment that's not even being worn by the priest. Passes by that to where the sword is. The sword's not wrapped in anything regal. Isn't that cool? Am I just digging too deep? Do you like that? I think that's cool. So David does this. Now, the problem is, Doeg has seen it. So keep your eyes on Ahimelech and the priesthood. Um, what we're going to see next. So then David flees. This scene is really bizarro. <laughs> and it doesn't give us a whole lot of detail until you read the psalm. And the psalm is going to kind of make sense of the scene. Like, I could not for the life of me figure out what is going on here exactly. Um, so let's read verse 10 through the rest of 21. This is a very short chapter. 10 to 15. And it's got a, a couple really funny lines in there too. David flees to Gath. And then he just leaves. He departs. What, what is that? Well, it helps to know, uh, like, always follow the geography and the names of cities and things. That really helps. David rose and he fled that day from Saul to <coughs> Akish, or however you want to say it, Akish, however, the king of Gath. We've heard of Gath before. Where is Gath? Anyone remember? Wait down here. Yep, yeah, wait down there on the page. It's a, what's that? It's a Philistine city. It's known for um, a lot of intelligentsia, and it just happens to be the hometown of Goliath. Do you remember that? This is where Goliath comes from. What is David thinking? He goes back to the hometown of Goliath carrying Goliath's sword? What? And he tries to make some kind of deal with, with the king? And why is there a king? It should be more like a mayor. Gath isn't a kingdom, it's just a little city. So, so whether that's just like kind of a little hyperbole, they call him a king. He's really like the overlord or the mayor or something. But they call him a king. I'm not really sure why that is. Um, and, and the servants of Achish, or Achish, however you say it, said to him, Isn't this David, the king of the land? Didn't they sing to one another? Like, he doesn't know that David's the king. But what does he know? The people were singing all these things about him. So he's kind of like making fun of Saul on one hand, kind of like making fun of David. And it appears David took the words to heart. What is it? It doesn't sound like he said anything all that bad. What, what is he taking to heart? So then he starts acting like he's insane, and he feigns himself a madman. Why? What did Akish say? What's going on here? Does anybody, can you tell from reading that? Maybe I totally missed it, but... But it's very Jesus-like. It oh, it's very Jesus-like in what way? In that Jesus was a king of the what, um, what is it that makes David start thinking, well, I've got to act crazy so I can get out of here? Like, wh why? <laughs> What's he doing? Why does he go in there and then go, oh, now I'm in trouble, I have to act, I have to act nuts. Yeah, that's the part I never understood. What's that? Okay, so, so part of it is, like, like you said last week, the enemy... Oh, my right. enemies <laughs> is my friend. Right. So to a degree, yeah, to a degree there's something for sure going on there. Maybe David thinks, I mean, that's what I'm thinking. He goes there in the first place because he knows that they are enemies of Saul. So he probably thinks somehow he's thinking, maybe I can somehow make some kind of arrangement with them. Maybe I can get some more tools, some more equipment, some more men. Maybe some, But it doesn't really say what happens that makes David go, ooh, this isn't working. I need to now act insane. No, this isn't the same it doesn't really explain what happens in here that turns, that turns it. There's one little line in the psalm. The psalm that's connected to this is Psalm 56. And this is what, like, to me, I was like, oh, this ties up the whole thing. Why didn't they say this in 1 Samuel <laughs> to explain it? I don't know. Psalm 56, in the introduction of Psalm 56, for the director, according to Yanath Alam Rakhlachu, whatever. So just meaning like, it's probably that tune that's going to sing to you. A mitkam of David 
when the Philistines seized him at Gath. This doesn't say anything about him being seized in 1 Samuel. So it appears like he went there, they said these things, they seized him, they put him in prison, so he goes, how do I get out of here? I've got to act insane, right? So now that was a piece that was missing to me. It was like, I just do not understand what's going on here. So he seemed to think like he could go there and probably make friends with them since they were enemies of Saul. Or did they capture him? But, yeah, yeah, it, it sounds like he's captured. He's so he might not have gone in willingly. They, they no, it says he went there, he rose and fled right to the king. And the servant said to him, is this not David? So it sounds like he went there very willingly. Or did he leave? So, what, so whatever's going on here, it's, it's really, it's, and it doesn't tell us what's in David's mind, and it doesn't tell us here in 1 Samuel that they, that they seize him. But the psalm says, David writes the psalm because he's seized by the Philistines. So to me, that like at least, like, okay, I kind of get what's going on. I still don't understand his motive totally. But this is what he writes. Psalm 56 is very short. Have mercy on me, God, for I am treated harshly. So he's probably like writing this in prison while he's besieged, trying to figure out what to do. Attackers press me all the day. My foes treat me harshly all the day. Yes, many are my attackers. Almost high when I am afraid, in you I place my trust. God, I praise your promise. In you I trust. I do not fear. What can mere flesh do to me? Isn't this great? We see the context of it then. Um, a little bit more. All the day they foil my plans. Their every thought is of evil against me. So it sounds like he did have some kind of plan, but he doesn't tell us what it is. <laughs> but all the days my, my foil, they foil my plans. They hide together in ambush. They watch my every step. They lie in wait for my life. They are evil. Watch them, God. Cast the nations down in your anger. My wanderings you have noted. Are my tears not stored in your vial? Are they not recorded in your book? My foes turn back when I call on you. This I know. God is on my side. God, I praise your promise. In you I trust. I do not fear. What can mere mortals do to me? Isn't that great? What I love is the, the, the king here, the mayor, whatever this guy's role is, he says, behold, you see the madman is in front of me. Do I lack madmen? Like, I just love that. That just cracks me up. Like, my own kingdom is filled with crazy people. Why are you sending me away? Do I need another one in my prison? So I think that might be part of why he lets him go. Like, we don't need, we don't need anyone else like that. You brought this fellow to play the madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? No, I don't want him near me. So they let him go. Why don't they kill him? I don't know. Maybe he gave, I don't know. Yeah, it doesn't say that, but I don't know why they didn't just kill him, but they didn't. They let him go. He's a madman. Because he's a madman. And he killed 10,000 of them. Yeah. I mean, yeah. they could have made it. But here's what starts to happen now is when David leaves, this interesting thing starts to happen where a group of people start to follow him. A, a ragtag group of like wounded people start to follow him. Why is that? Sounds familiar. This group of people that like are drawn to him and they start to present themselves in large numbers and start to become his followers. Really interesting as this kind of develops. So I want you to kind of watch. It's just, it's just a fascinating connection with what's going to happen with Jesus. Um, and, and during this time, he's still hiding. And throughout chapter 22, 23, and onward, it's going to use the same word over and over that he hides in the wilderness. But the wilderness means totally different things depending on where they are. It just means like a wild, not, not a city. Sometimes in biblical language, the wilderness is the desert. Right? A lot of times we think of the desert. It's just wild. There's nothing. There's no city. There's nothing there. But the wilderness can also be what we think of a lot of times when we think of trees and forests and wilderness that way. So depending on where he is, sometimes he's hiding in desert rocks, in between crevices and rocks. Sometimes he's in caves. Sometimes he's in the forest. And, and watch how this kind of plays out as, as he kind of runs and hides here. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, so it's just, I, I just love the characters in this so much. They're, they're so interesting. And I love that they're not just flat and, and easy to understand and like, oh, I know what he's going to do next because it's a soap opera. I know he's going to do this. And it's like, what, from one chapter to the next, I'm like, what the heck are you doing, David? <laughs> I'm like, it's not what I would have expected him to do. And so many times I love that about it. So real. So the next part is actually Psalm 57 which we'll read here in a minute, too. Let's just read chapter 22, verse 1 to 7. So he departs from whatever happens in Gath, some kind of imprisonment or something. He acts like a madman. He leaves there. They let him leave. He escapes to the cave of Adelman. So he's in a cave where his parents... Um, his brothers and all his father's house heard about it, and so the parents are coming, par his parents are elderly now, and they're coming to him. And everyone else who comes to him are people that are in distress, in debt, they're discontented. Interesting. Um, it's not a gathering of an army, but those who were hurt maybe by Saul's tyrannical governing Right? Maybe they were hurt by the politics of the time. Whatever it was, they're in distress, they're in debt, they're very discontented. And they know David, and they know his story, and they know what he's done. And every time he goes to battle, he wins. And there's something incredibly hopeful and attractive about this guy. So in this cave, they gather to him, along with a, a prophet called Gad, which is very interesting. And David goes from there to the king of Moab, another non-Jew. Huh. The king of Moab. Now, if you know anything about David's past, his, was his great-grandmother? His Ruth, who was a Moabite. So he's related distantly to those of Moab. And, and I don't know whether the king would know that or if David presents himself that way. It doesn't really tell us. But he says... Let my father and mother stay here with you till I know what God will do for me. Why doesn't he send his mother and his father to somewhere in, in Judah? Because Saul's, Saul's out to get him. So let's go to, again to Saul's enemy, right? And we're going we're gonna to put him in the Moabites and ask, ask them very nicely, like, my parents are descended from you guys. Can they hide out here? They're, they're elderly. Like, this is their nursing home years. <laughs> we're we're, we're going to... I want him here to be protected. And what's really interesting in verse 3, um, till I know what God will do for me, he does not name Yahweh. He doesn't say what, what the Lord will do for me. He uses the generic name Elohim because Moabites don't believe in Yahweh. It's just a little subtle thing. Like he knows how to, he knows politics. He knows how to play this. Don't name the Lord God, the Lord God Yahweh, <laughs> right? Because the Moabites don't know that. So he goes, I, I'm, I'm searching for what God wants for me. When I know what God will do for me, then, then uh, uh, maybe I'll come back for them, but can they stay for you? Can they stay with you for now? Isn't that, isn't that really cool? Just the way he kind of plays that. And he left them with the king of Moab, and they stayed with him all the time that David was in the stronghold. Then the prophet Gad says, Okay, David, time to stop running to other nations. Time to go back to Judah. So because it's coming from a prophet, David takes it as the word of the Lord. Right? So David departed and went into the forest of Hereth. That location is unknown. Um, maybe this, this Gad, this prophet, might be one of the prophets that, that Saul came upon earlier. You know, when he went into his ecstasy and crazy things happened to him. Could be one of those prophets. We don't really know. We just know this guy is a prophet. So David now is being told, okay, he's, he's tried to go to the Philistines. He's, tried, he's gone to Moab. Now the prophet says, you need to go back to Judah. It's time to start facing Saul, basically. Right? Meanwhile, Saul finds out what happened with the priest at Nob that protected David. Uh-oh. Not good. So Saul heard 
about David. Let's read... Oh, let's just read the rest of it because it's all one big long story. Chapter 22, verse 6 through 23. Do you recognize the hand of Satan? I get so angry when you hear about that kind of violence, you know? And it's just stuff that happens in the world today. And that, oh, you get so angry, and like the only way it comes out is to weep. Because what do you do? What can you do? You can't go punch them in the face. And like, oh, it's just, it's so wickedly wrong. Like that response is just so bad at so many levels. Remember, Saul is the anti anointed one. Anointed one is Christ. So he is the anti Christ. Saul is a type of of the Antichrist. So you know how we say David is a type of Jesus. He points forward to Jesus. We want to know what the Antichrist is going to be like. It's like Saul. He has the potential for great. What's that? <laughs> don't, say, don't say anything political. <laughs> he has the potential for wonderful things. He has the potential of in those moments when he hears the voice of God, when it breaks through, we're going to see it happen again and again through Saul's life before he dies. Again and again, he has these moments, these glimpses of sanity. And then it's just like evil takes over, right? He is, this is what we look for, is that kind of pattern. That's why it's so good to study um, the lives of these guys. So David leaves from there, and it's discovered by Saul. Saul, again, sitting instead of with a scepter or a, wand or whatever a king he's got his spear <laughs> he's sitting there and Saul says to his servants hear now you Benjaminites he is speaking the way the Lord God spoke to the Israelites he says Shema O Israel right, that's what the Lord God would he's trying to take on that kind of authority hear now O Benjaminites he's he's lording obnoxiously over people that are already <clears throat> under his command they're already Benjaminites with him. They already follow him. And he's like lording over them with this, this like false power, this paranoia. Um, he ends up accusing his own people in this. Um, uh, will the son of Jesse, will David give every one of you fields and vineyards? Will he make you commanders? No, but I will. Right? Um, no one disclosed to me when my son made a covenant with Jesse's son. That's what the league is. It's really talking about when, when the two boys made a covenant. No one told me about it. Oh, he's furious. None of you is sorry for me or disclosed to me that my son has stirred up my servant against me. Now he's blaming his own son, Jonathan, for stirring up David. The guy is utterly off his rocker. Right? He's so paranoid. He's just grasping for straws, blaming everybody and everything. It is. It's what evil does. And divide, 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 right? Constant division among people. Um, to lie in wait as to this day. Then answered Doag the Edomite. Oh, I knew we'd see him again. The foreigner, the no-gooder, the betrayer, right? Oh, by the way, I saw the son of Jesse coming to Nob, to Ahimelech. I saw it. He went to the priests. Oh, he went to the priest, eh? Um, before we read on into that, I want to look at when, uh, when David was hiding in the cave at the beginning of chapter 22, the cave of, cave of Edelam. Psalm 57 is for the director. Do not destroy, says the direction in Psalm uh, 57.1. I don't know what that means. Do not destroy. Um, a miktam of David when he fled from Saul into the cave. So this is at the beginning of chapter 22, Psalm 57. I'm just going to read one little part of it. Have mercy on me, God. Have mercy on me. In you I seek shelter. You get that? He's hiding in the cave. I just love it. <laughs> it makes so much sense. In the shadow of your wings I seek shelter till harm passes by. I call to you, God Most High, to 
the God who provides for me. May God send help from heaven to save me. Shame those who trample upon me. May God send fidelity and love. Um, and on and on he goes, really entrusting in the Lord. Isn't that awesome? And then here, where Doeg the Edomite turns him in, I just found this one today. I didn't even know this was here. Psalm 52, the deceitful tongue, it's called. Psalm 52, for the leader, a mascal of David, when Doeg the Edomite went and told Saul, David went to the house of Ahimelech. Like it totally tells us exactly what this psalm is about. Psalm 52, it's very short. So this is what David writes in this moment. This is what he's feeling when, it, when Doeg turns on him. Why do you glory in evil, you scandalous liar? All day long you plot destruction. Your tongue is like sharpened razor. You're, you skillful deceiver. You love evil rather than good, lies rather than honest speech. You love any word that destroys you, deceitful tongue. Now God will strike you down, leave you crushed forever, pluck you from your tent, uproot you from the land of the living. The righteous will look on with awe, and they will jeer, and they will say, that one did not take God as a refuge, but trusted in wealth, relied on devious plots. But I, like an olive tree in the house of God, trust in God's faithful love forever. I will praise you always, Lord, for what you have done. I will proclaim before the faithful that your name is good. Isn't that great? So for Psalm 52. Doeg the Edomite turns on them. So Saul rallies up his men and tells them, go out and kill the priests of the Lord. All right, after he has a couple words um, with the priest, the priest seems very confused. He has no idea what's going on. Like, um, who among all your servants is so faithful as David? Like, who is the king's son-in-law? Who is the captain over your bodyguard? Is today the first time that I've inquired to God of him? No, let not the king impute anything to his servant or to the house of my father. Like, I thought you guys were buddies. Why are you mad at us? What's going on? David's part of the royal family. He's a hero. So Saul tells his guards, his servants, to turn on the priests. Innocent life means nothing to Saul. Amen? It doesn't mean anything to him. He then imposes, and they won't do it, so who does do it? Doeg. He puts them under basically what in Israel would have been the ban when they go after a, a city and slaughter everything. And this is under Saul's command, not under the word of the Lord. And basically, it's a holy war against his own priests. Saul's insanity and paranoia and revenge and violence now kills almost every standing member of the Israelite priesthood. I mean, can you, there already a bunch of them died in Shiloh. A bunch of them died in the battle way back when, when they took the Ark of the Covenant back in chapter 4. And now, it was it 86, 85? More are killed. The only one that we're told that escapes is Abiathar, which we're going to hear a lot about him a little bit later. He has effectively destroyed the priesthood of Israel. Not only is there now no, I mean, the Ark of the Covenant is hiding out in some small town, right? It's been there for a while. There's no tabernacle. Now there's no priests. What are they going to do for forgiveness? What are they going to do for worship? What are they going to do on their high holy days? They're going to go straight to hell. <laughs> That's the short version. <laughs> They're going to go straight to hell. There's no cleansing. There's no worship. You know, at this time, the rabbis and the priests were the ones doing the teaching, too. They didn't have synagogues yet. Synagogues come later. Like, so they're also the teachers for Israel. Saul has effectively destroyed the foundation of the nation. 
and he doesn't care. And when, this is really important, when Abiathar leaves Saul and flees and goes to David, this is when the priesthood effectively changes from Saul to David. Right? This is when the priesthood is going to be under the command of David. This is where the future is going to be. And that's a really big deal. Um, the, the election of David is going to be the rejection of Saul. And this is how it's playing out. In the, in the ultimate most evil act of killing his own priests. Oh my gosh. How evil is this guy? And David says, I have occasioned the death of the persons of your father's house. What's he saying? I'm responsible. I knew, I saw that creepy guy. <laughs> I saw that Doeg, the Edomite. I knew he was there, and I knew he would tell Saul. And it's my fault. So stay with me. And don't fear, because he seeks my life too, just like he seeks your life. We're in this together. So this is a, a major no-turn-back event in the life of Saul. And, and again, like we said a couple weeks ago, I think part of why God has let him remain as king and, st and hasn't just totally removed him is, is like Saul still has a chance to turn around and do the right thing. Like God is leaving him an opportunity to correct his course. This is a no-turning-back moment. I mean, he just slaughtered his priesthood. Oh my gosh. Maybe it's to expose oh my gosh. The Maybe God would say so the Lord tells David, Behold, the Philistines are fighting again. Oh, really? Oh <laughs> the Philistines are fighting? I can't imagine. That's like shocking. <laughs> John said, That's like a sale at Art Band. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> incredibly, who, who would have ever thought? <laughs> so let's read, this is where we'll probably leave off. Read chapter 23, verse 1 to 14. Nothing startling happens here except um, David's men are kind of, you know, congealing, however you want to say they're coming together here. Yeah, thank you. So they're not really sure. Um, Kyla is 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 down near Hebron. It's near the border, um, not not far from Philistine territory. So it's just a little border area, and it looks like um, while they were in the midst of their harvesting on the threshing floor, it looked like the Philistines raided and said, "Well, they're paying all attention to the crops. We're going to come and steal their herds." So it looks like it's kind of happened. So they came to steal the, the herds. And uh, so David inquires of the Lord. Unlike Saul, David asked the Lord, I'm not just going into battle because I feel like it. Shall I go and attack the Philistines? And it sounds like this is just through prayer because it's something we're going to see in a minute. This seems like it's kind of a prayerful thing. And the Lord says to David, yeah, yeah, go and attack them and, and protect them. Um, so, so he goes and he attacks them and he wins. And he becomes, David delivered the inhabitants. David is their savior. <laughs> he is their savior, right? Mm -hmm. David is acting here as a king should act. And just in this little, this little scene, he's inquiring of the Lord. He's protecting his people. He's making a stand, right? He's doing the right thing. And he acts as their savior. So... Abiathar, remember, is the only priest that we know of that's remaining, as far as we know. He's the only one that was mentioned that got out. He comes to David, and now he has the ephod. And then they start to ask questions of the Lord. Why is that important? What's the ephod? Yeah, okay. It's the what of the priesthood? It's the garment of the priesthood. It's symbolic of the priesthood. And what's in the ephod? Those stones, the Urim and Thummim, or whatever they're called. The, I always forget what they're called. The Urim and 
Urim and Thummim, whatever, the, the two stones that they roll when they're, when they're inquiring of the Lord, when they cast lots. Because they, and it's a yes-no thing. Lord, you want me to do this? Yes, no. Lord, you want me to do this? Yes, no. And that's kept in the pocket in the ephod. So, basically, that's the way, before the Holy Spirit comes, right? We've talked about this a few times. This is kind of the way Israel would inquire the mind of the Lord, other than through prayer. It looked like earlier he was kind of praying, because now he's got the ephod and the stones, it looks like. So he's asking all these questions. Lord, you want me to do this? Yes, no. Lord, should I do Yes, no. Should I go here? Yes, no. Um, and Saul finds out that David has come to this little city, and it's, it's got gates around it. It's got bars around it. Oh, great. David's a sitting duck. He's sitting in this little village, all closed in, and, and we're going to besiege it. And Saul says, God has given them into my hand. I'll let you make commentary. <laughs> but it's not Yahweh. It's not Yahweh. Actually, yep, you're right. Very good. It, it's the same word that the pagan used earlier. Mm -hmm. Elohim has given them into my hand. Great catch. Later on, he does call him the Lord, and a little bit later, the Lord, the priest of the Lord, I think he says, right? Um, somewhere down there, he says something about the, the priest of the Lord. But yeah, here he's saying, God has delivered them. Yeah, he can't even say the name of the Lord when he says that, you know? Oh my gosh. What's your commentary? God has given them into my hand. I'm going to win. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think he's hearing from the Lord? Probably not. Well, David knew that Saul was plotting against him. And he says, bring the ephod here. Oh, Lord. Surely you've heard that Saul has come. Will the men surrender me into his hand? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? O oh Lord, I beg you, tell your servant. And the Lord said, he will come down. Then said David, will the men of, of Kela surrender me? And the Lord said, they will surrender you. So then David and his men, there were now not 400. How many of them are there? Huh, that's a pretty darn good inflationary rate there. Talk about evangelization, <laughs> and you want numbers to grow. 400 to 600 in a couple weeks. That's pretty darn good. Um, so they arose and they departed from there. Before Saul gets there, they depart, and they went wherever they could go. And Saul was told that David had escaped, and he pursued him with great vigor, right? No, eh, I just, he just gave up. <laughs> If the Lord God told him to do it, you think he'd have a little bit of energy and vigor. And he goes, ah, oh, well, he's not there. All right, I just give up. <laughs> he gives up on the expedition. And David remains in the strongholds of the wilderness, in the hill country of the wilderness of Ziph. Um, these are high grounds. There's a lot of cover. It could be kind of foresty, but this isn't like the wilderness in the sense of a desert. It's a, it's a kind of a wild kind of terrain in there. And Saul sought him every day, but God did not give him into his hand. So Saul is spending his nights praying, Lord, give me David. I want to slice his throat, right? David's praying, Lord, let me escape. One of them has God on his side. <laughs> We're watching the election of David and the rejection of Saul, right? over and over. So when we pick up in our next exciting adventure, David is going to again elude Saul in the wilderness. And we're going to see coming up three opportunities where David is literally inches away from taking the life of Saul. And he doesn't do it. Really great. Oh, there's some great drama in there. Really great storytelling. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that one's funny. <laughs> Yeah, some of this is, oh, this is, isn't this great storytelling? I love this story. Thanks for joining us in the Catholic Community Scripture Study as we walk through 1st and 2nd Samuel.